Hello everyone, Jim Staley here, Passion for Truth Ministries, and welcome to today's broadcast. We are at the end of our All About Feast Day series. This is the seventh feast day of the Lord. It's the most exciting, hands down. It's the Festival of Sukkot. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is when Jesus, Yeshua, was born. We're gonna talk about that, all kinds of incredible things. Stay tuned right after this. All right, my friends, welcome back. Like I said, this is an exciting broadcast because we're going to be finishing the feast days of the Lord, all seven of them. And this is the culmination, the festival of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, where Yeshua tabernacled amongst us by being born in Bethlehem in a manger 2,000 years ago. We're going to talk about the depth of the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to talk about uh, the ancient Hebrew customs, what they did, how it affected the New Testament disciples, and how it affects us today. And I've got something I promise you, you've likely never heard. It's super exciting dealing with the water libation ceremony and how it relates to Christ himself. So let's dive in. Let's begin. And we'll start off by doing a quick review. I'm not going to do a long review because we've already done this in every video but let's just break down real quickly that all seven feast days of the Lord, they're broken down into two categories. The spring feast days of the Lord, which are all connected to his first coming, and the fall feast days of the Lord, which are connected to his second coming. So if you're new to this, that's an important thing to know right off the bat. So let's talk about the feast days of the Lord in the spring. First of all, he dies on Passover that evening. Then he goes into the grave and there, there is a seven-day feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread where every Jew is getting uh, yeast out of their house representing sin. Yeshua is dealing with sin in the grave. He raises from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits like they did every single year for 1,400 years straight. And then 50 days later is the Feast of Shavuot or better known in Greek as Pentecost and that's when the Holy Spirit was given. So you can see the absolute timing of all of these feast days are all about his first and second coming. Now, when we get to the second coming of Christ, we're dealing in the fall with the last three feast days. The Feast of Yom Terah, today called Rosh Hashanah, that's the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Blowing and Shouting. That is the return of the Messiah when the ancient kings of Israel were crowned and inaugurated as king. That's that day. Then 10 days later, called the 10 Days of Awe, the rapture happens at Yom Terah, the Feast of Trumpets, after the, tr the Great Tribulation. I know many of you will disagree with me on that. You can do that in the comments below. We'll talk about it. Uh, but then we have the wrath of God. The tribulation is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God comes after the tribulation. That's when his wrath is poured out on everyone that's left. His bride is already gone, gone into the chambers, if you will. And then we have Judgment Day. That's Yom Kippur. We talked about that and all about Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement where the high priest went into the Holy of Holies one time a year for the redemption and the forgiveness of the sins of Israel. Today, now, we're going to be talking about the Feast of Sukkot. The Feast of Sukkot is five days after Yom Kippur, and it is on the 15th day of Tishrei. So Tishrei 1, which is the seventh month on the Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar, uh, Tishrei 1 is Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Tishrei 10 is Yom Kippur and Tishrei 15 is Sukkot. So let's talk about it. And by the way, this here is one of my favorite shirts on earth dealing with the feast days. It's our custom made Sukkot shirt. It's where he came to tabernacle among us and it's got the little manger right in there. If you want to get this shirt, you can go to our website at passionfortruth.com and click the store link at the very top and it'll show you all of our items. We have tons of items for sale, including tons of items on Sukkot itself. So if you're a Sukkot junkie like me, you can go pick up your shirt or your mug, coffee mug, tumbler, whatever you want to pick up. All right, let's continue. Let's talk about a few Sukkot facts. I'm going to burn through some of these because there is a section of this teaching I want to get to quickly because it's very exciting. But first of all, it is a seven-day feast with an eighth great day. So it's kind of confusing because God said it's a seven-day feast, but he considers it an eight-day uh, feast because he added a day at the very end called the Great Day, and it's separate, but it's connected. And there's a reason why he did that. He didn't call it an eight-day feast. 
He called it a seven-day feast, and he added an eighth great day. And that, my friends, is all about prophecy, the end of time. Why? Because you're dealing with seven 1,000-year days of Christ, right? So you've got of, of mankind, uh, six days of creation, and then the rest on the seventh day, seven-day week. In the same way, a day is a 1,000 years, so mankind's existence on this earth will be seven prophetic days, which is 7,000 years. At the end of 7,000 years, there is an eighth great day, and that's the new heavens and the new earth, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, all right? And uh, and so, and also, by the way, this is kind of uh, amazing if you didn't know this, but Sukkot uh, is the origin of the American Thanksgiving Day. That's right. When Columbus sailed in 1492 to head over here, didn't know where he was going, he was actually Jewish. And it was that year that was the Spanish Inquisition in Spain, where they were kicking out all the Jews that were in Spain at the time. And believe it or not, yes, he was Jewish. And his grandfather was very, very Jewish. And so it wasn't just partnering with the Spanish crown. There was an Inquisition at that time, and almost everyone on board uh, was Jewish. And so it's incredible that God used the Jewish people to found the uh, the United States of America. And so when you're dealing with the Puritans, they come from that background and the holidays were very familiar with them. And Sukkot was a holiday that uh, back in their heritage, they were celebrating with giant feast. It was their harvest time festival in Israel. And that watered down version ended up in America and is known today as Thanksgiving, which is why it's in a similar time period as when Sukkot is. All right, the word Sukkot is a plural word for the word Sukkah. The word Sukkah is a booth. That's what it means in Scripture. It's a temporary dwelling place. So picture a lean-to out in the middle of a farmer's field. That is what a sukkah is. A sukkah is simply like a tent. A sukkah today can be a camper, right? It can be a motel room. Uh, but more than, than not, it is, is like a tent. It's, it's something that you build, that you stay in, you sleep in, and it's temporary. It's not permanent. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest example of a sukkah that I can think of today is you. That's right. You are a temporary dwelling place. This body, thank God, is not permanent. It's just temporary. It's where the Holy Spirit dwells. He dines with us. He sups with us. He dwells inside of us temporarily until the day that we die and we just walk out of this body into our permanent uh, uh, bodies that God will resurrect from the dead. Amen? All right, let's continue. Sukkot facts. Sukkot was the seventh feast... It occurred during the seventh month, which would have been during the seventh full moon of the year, and it was to be celebrated for seven days. You can see that on God's prophetic calendar, seven is always the number of perfection. God perfects things in sevens. And that's why you see in this, this particular feast day of being the seventh feast day, the seventh full moon, it's on the seventh month. And it is, uh, it's celebrated for seven days because all these sevens, God's saying, look, this is the culmination. This is the perfection. This is it. And as a believer in Christ, this is exciting. I don't know why we didn't grow up on these. I don't know why the, uh, the Christian church for the last 1,800 years has not been teaching these. But our Catholic forefathers ditched God's prophetic calendar for the Roman uh, uh, hol holiday calendar, which added in all kinds of pagan things. And we've been missing out on the depth and the breadth of the power of the living God in his calendar. When we do Bible things in Bible ways, we can expect Bible results, right? And that's what we're trying to do today is learn these calendar holidays so we can incorporate them into our lives and at the very least learn the prophetic symbolism that's connected to them. In Sukkot, each day represents 1,000 years. We talked about that and how the eighth great day is the new heaven and the new earth. They also sacrificed 70 bulls during Sukkot for the 70 nations. So ironically, Israel, God gave them this feast day, this uh, festival of, of eight days and said, look, I want you to sacrifice 70 bulls for the 70 nations. You know what we would call that today? Evangelism. 
That's right. God was concerned about them evangelizing and praying for their neighbors. That's what they were doing. They're sacrificing these bulls for all 70 nations, including their enemies. So don't tell me that Matthew chapter 5 is the first place that Christ says, hey, I want you to pray for your enemies. No, they're sacrificing and praying for their enemies right now here, all the way back in ancient Israel, this idea of celebration during the time of Sukkot was that they wanted all the earth to come to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they were praying and sacrificing on their behalf. And of course, lastly, I alluded to it earlier, this celebration is celebrated at the end of the harvest and at the end of the grape harvest at the end of the year. As you can see on your screen, these are just some examples of what a sukkah would look like. This is a sukkah that we did in one of our past sukkots. Every single year, we bring hundreds of people to our sukkot to celebrate for eight days. You are more than welcome to go. If you get the gumption to want to go to one of our sukkots, go to passionfortabernacles.com and we have all kinds of information on, on this year's Feast of Sukkot and what it takes to get there. It's a very exciting time. You can see that some people, uh, they will dine inside. Some people sleep inside of their sukkahs. You can make them out of just about anything. Here's one that's on top of a building. Here's one right here in Israel where people sell these. There's companies that sell these and they put them on their balconies outside of their apartments and they have a temporary dwelling place and they will live in that thing all week long. And it's an exciting time where everything is focused on God. Everything is, your materialism of life is gone. Simplicity of life sets in for one week and you have to deal with one another in those simple environments. All right, now let's take a look at some scripture that deals with the Feast of Sukkot in its illusion. Here we go. Mark chapter 9 verse 2 says this, now after six days, Yeshua took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. So this is the Mount of Transfiguration. Then Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here and let us make three sukkahs, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So you can see that this is likely the time of Sukkot. It's in their mind. That's why they're saying, hey, let us build you sukkahs. It's the time of Sukkot and they're showing up. It makes perfect sense why Yeshua would show up with Moses and Elijah during this time period, recognizing in the future prophetically, this is going to be a big day. This is the day of transfiguration. It's the new heaven and new earth. Everything is going to revolve around this prophetic holiday. Now, I mentioned earlier, just in, in the introduction, that we're going to talk about Jesus being born during the Feast of Sukkot. And for some of you that are brand new, you might be thinking, what? Are you crazy? It's December 25th. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Unfortunately, no. December 25th was the birthday of every pagan sun god across the planet. And if you haven't seen December 25th on trial, it's a documentary that documents in great detail everything about why we really chose December 25th, or why I should say the Roman Catholic Church chose December 25th to be the birthday of Christ. Also, I encourage you to watch Truth or Tradition if you haven't already. Those are two popular teachings that go into great depth of why we do what we do uh, during the time of Christmas and why Jesus was not born on Christmas Day. He was born during the festival of Sukkot. How do we know that? Well, because we know when the birthday of John the Baptist was. His father was Zechariah, and Zechariah was a priest that served in the temple. And according to the Old Testament, Zechariah was of the eighth course of Abiha. There were 24 different courses of priests that served at 24 different times. Each course served a week in the temple twice a year. And so we know that Zechariah was in the temple during that eighth week of the year. And the Bible says that when he came home, his wife was excited to see him and they conceived a child. Well, because we know that the gestational period is nine months after a baby is conceived in the mother's womb, we simply go nine months from that eighth week of Abiha, which was around the time of Pentecost, and nine months later comes to Passover. So once we know that John the Baptist was born 
at Passover, when we know he was born, then we know that Mary, the mother of Christ, was simply six months behind her. And six months later puts us right at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's right. Not possible to be during the 25th of December. It is the Feast of Tabernacles, which makes perfect sense because if you back up nine months earlier to the time he was conceived, he was conceived during the Festival of Lights, which is Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. The world was dedicated through Christ during the fe Festival of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. He was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is why John says he tabernacled amongst men. And there's so much more to be said about that. If you would like more information on everything that I just talked about, I have an entire teaching built on that. Text the word BIRTH to 844-763-9543 and you will immediately get a link to, a, to more information that will detail that out for you in an article, okay? All right, let's continue. Solomon dedicated the temple during Sukkot. We see this in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 and 2. It says, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. So we know that through this and 1 Kings section, talking about the same uh, time period, that the temple of God, Solomon's temple, was literally dedicated during the Feast of Sukkot. And look what happened. When he did the sacrifices and all the people were together in one accord and the singers were there, the fire of God came down and the Holy Spirit filled the temple in an extraordinary way. Look at this. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we sacrifice our lives, when we are in one accord with our brethren, when we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself, the Holy Spirit comes down and dwells in you. And it should be so thick that you can't see anymore, but your inner man, your eyes of your inner man, the spiritual man, is the one seen. So you walk into the spiritual temple, your physical eyes can't see a thing, but you are walking by the Spirit, not by sight. Amen. All right, so not only was the first temple dedicated, but the second temple was dedicated on Sukkot as well. Ezra 3, 4 tells us that. And also, it, not just the first temple and the second temple, but when the second temple was destroyed and Nehemiah came back, a famous story in Nehemiah where he rebuilt the wall, guess when he dedicated the wall? That's right, during the festival of Sukkot. That's how important the festival of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, was to early believers in God, is that they major dedications were done on it because there is no greater holiday on God's prophetic calendar than the festival of Sukkot because it is the celebration of the harvest. Ladies and gentlemen, think of the prophetic connections to this. At the end of time, all of the harvest of souls is done the doors have been shut during Yom Kippur. The marriage supper of the Lamb is ensuing and, con and, con and, is, and is moving towards its culmination. The bridegroom comes out of the chamber with his bride. That's the 10 days of awe. And they come before the world during the festival of Sukkot for the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation. All of this is connected. It's absolutely amazing. How did we not learn this growing up? To me... Nothing could be more excited. If we are celebrating this as a people in ancient times, and God gives it to his people prophetically about the second coming of Christ that they didn't even know about, and Christ is celebrating it, his disciples are celebrating it, all the early believers are celebrating it, why don't we celebrate it today? Because we're going to be celebrating it even in the millennium. Check it out. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 6. Now, this is in the millennium, my friends. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, we know who that is, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now look, the value system of God says it's so valuable he wanted his people to keep it in the Old Testament. It's so valuable the disciples uh, kept it even after they were saved and it's so valuable that even after Christ comes for his bride for a thousand years, he says, you better keep it. You'll be coming up to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles 
or else I'm cutting rain off from your land, he goes on to say. So if it wasn't important, he would not be mandating it in the millennium. How much more now? Because these are all prophetic rehearsals for the real thing that's to come. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five says this, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we would have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And like I said earlier, this illusion is because Sukkot was such a big deal in the first century. It was connected to everything, everything they did from, the, from when Sukkot is over with and they start planting seeds, those seeds get harvested at the next Sukkot. All of the rain, all of the praying, everything, the, the, all, the water libation ceremony, everything that is happening throughout the, throughout the year from Passover all the way is looking toward this great moment where there's going to be a harvest and this harvest is going to be plenty and there's going to be plenty of everything because this is the end of the year. Everything that hasn't been harvested yet gets harvested. And that prophetically is so beautiful when you put it in the spiritual realm. All right, so now I was going fast, I know that, but it was all to get to this moment, this moment right here. This is all about the water libation ceremony is what I'm gonna talk about right now. This was the culmination in the first century of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles was this ceremony. And so we're gonna talk about this because this water libation ceremony is so connected to our Lord and so connected to our lives that I, I, I can't wait to share this with you because you're going to say amen and, uh, and amen, I promise you. This joy of the water libation ceremony and the lights of the temple and Sukkot was so extraordinary that it says that the Temple Institute has this quote, in fact, this joy was so immense and the celebration so uplifting that the sages of Israel emphatically stated, quote, whoever has never seen the celebrations of the festival of the water libation has never experienced true joy in his life. That's what kind of celebration this really was. So I want you, I want you to see on your screen here, this is a rendition of what the court before you get into the temple, the outer courts would look like where you have the court of the women, which is really the upper balcony that you can see uh, there. And then all the men would be dancing down below. And I want you to focus on one single thing. Right in the middle, there is a lamp post. This lamp post had four giant five gallon vessels of oil that were burning. So this was a massive uh, candelabra is really what this was. This was like a street light on steroids, imagine five gallons of, of olive oil burning in four different areas that was lighting up the entire temple. It was so light, it says that, the, the, <laughs> that, that this light would cast itself for six miles all the way into Bethlehem. It would create a shadow. That's how bright the city was at night for this ceremony. Now check this out, what the wicks of these lights were made of. This is where it gets exciting. The wicks for these lights were made from the old and worn clothing of the priest. The lamps towered over the court and shone forth with a light so bright that there was not a single courtyard in all of Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the light of the festival of the water libation. So check this out. The four wicks were made from the priest clothes. The clothes of the priest is what made up those wicks. Now, why is that so important? Because when we go over to the New Testament and we get to John chapter 19, it becomes a mic drop moment. John 19, 23 says this, then the soldiers, now he's crucified at this point. When they had crucified Yeshua, they took his garments, which were priestly garments. Remember, they put a priestly garment on him and they made four parts of it. They cut it into four pieces, every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. That they didn't tear, but the, the garment of Christ, which was a priestly garment, they cut it into four pieces. Think of this, my friends. The prophetic connection is extraordinary. 
you have one single pole in the courtyard in Jerusalem during the festival lights, during the, the, the water libation ceremony, and that one pole is responsible for four wicks, one for each corner of the world, they say. So they took a priestly garment and it made it the wick for one. That was for one part corner of the earth. Then another priestly garment for another wick, for another corner of the earth, and so on and so forth. Till in their mind, all four corners of the earth would be illuminated by one pole split into four. Yeshua was the one light that was split into four. And they didn't even know what they were doing. When they cut his garment into four, they had no idea. They were following their own tradition of splitting a, a priestly garment into four different lights for the four corners of the earth. Yeshua was the light of the world, and he was cut down, and he was stripped, he was naked, and then he was sent to all four corners of the world by the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit himself absolutely incredible if you ask me and we're not even done yet that's just his garment in the jerusalem talmud it says this herein lies the true secret of the festival of the water libation the great joy was in the receiving of prophetic inspiration did you hear what they just said 2,000 years ago, they're reporting that during the, the water libation ceremony, during the, uh, the Feast of, of Sukkot, prophetic inklings were at their height. The joy was so great that people were getting prophetic words. This is before Acts chapter 2. This has nothing to do even with Christianity. This is inside of Judaism. They're getting prophetic insights during this time period. Why? Because when you are aligned with God's prophetic rhythm and clock, the timing becomes perfect. And so as you are doing Bible things in Bible ways, God in heaven, which is where the pattern came from, they're doing the same thing. And when you're walking in the rhythm of heaven and during the festival of Sukkot, you're at the height of spiritual activity and the, so people were so focused on God that, at that moment, and the, the, the festivities were so phenomenal, people were getting prophetic insight, and I think it's absolutely incredible. Now we move to the water libation ceremony where they, they took the water, they would go down to the Pool of Siloam, which was an acre-wide pool that they're excavating right now in Israel. I've been there, it's extraordinary. It's a one acre, it's huge pool. They would go in on one side, strip down to nothing, come out on the other side, they would be given a, a white robe, go figure, and after they've been mikvahed, and then they would climb the stairs of the Ophel, all right, and all the way to the temple. And that, that symbolizes the whole prophetic journey of salvation, another story for another day. But dealing with that, they would come down and get water from the Pula Siloam and then bring out the best singers, the best musicians, Man, they've got their best playlist on Spotify going, and they're going back up uh, to the to the temple itself. And they lap, they go through the water gate, and they come up to the altar. And this is extraordinary. What I'm about to tell you. So pay attention because if you can't tell, I'm excited because God didn't miss a beat in His prophetic symbolism. Everything they did. In the, in the Old Covenant was for prophetic reasons and insights, and the reason why we're, we do things today is to remind us that these great, incredible things have happened. So they would go up on top of the altar, the brazen altar, which was massive at that point. We're talking like 30 feet tall in the air with a ramp, and you can see from the picture here. And then what they would do is there was two grooves on the side of the altar. One was where they would pour the water that they just got from the Pool of Siloam, and the other was a larger hole that would uh, hold the blood of the sacrifice. So what they would do is they would pour the sacrificial blood in one hole and the water in the other hole at the exact same time. And because they're different viscosity, blood is thicker than water, they made the hole for the water smaller and they made the blood, uh, the hole for the blood larger so that it would drip into the bowl at the bottom of the altar at exactly the same time. 
the blood and the water would come out and mix at the exact moment. Think about this. Yeshua on the cross being crucified. And what was happening is the blood was, was coming out. It was dripping down his face, dripping down his body. And the Roman soldier came up and stuck him with a spear. And the Bible says that blood and water gushed out and hit the earth at the exact same time. Yeshua was the water libation ceremony sacrifice. He was the combination of the water of the, that brings life to the earth, that gave them the harvest that they had. There is no harvest without what's called mayim in Hebrew, which means water. And incredibly, the word heaven is shemaim, which is a combination of two Hebrew words, mayim and shem. Shem is name. It means the name of God. Water comes from God. It comes from God's name. That's what they called the heavens. And that water is when it's mixed with the blood, it brings life spiritually. You see, water in the physical realm can bring life. But when you mix the water of God's word with the blood of the Messiah, which is eternal, you have eternal life. Not just life, but life abundantly. And that's what Sukkot is all about. It is about the reality of Christ fulfilling the marriage vow that he made in the garden when the enemy serpent inserted his seed into mankind and mankind's DNA got messed up and we are bent towards Hasatan, we're bent towards the enemy, we're bent towards selfishness and in not doing Bible things in Bible ways. It was Christ that set us free, broke the bondage and the chains, and gave us the opportunity that said, look, if you'll do this, if you'll accept me into your life, but not just accept me, if you will believe upon me. What does believe mean in Hebrew? Trust and obey. Obey me. Those who love me, keep my commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. It's all about obedience. When we find ourselves loving God, we find ourselves obeying God. Now, I'm not talking about the legalism. I'm talking about being legal. I'm talking about it's not legalistic to have one wife and love her for the rest of your life. It's just legal. There's a blessing to do so. And in the same way, God says, look, if you just trust me in these things, celebrate these feast days, get them involved in your family, add a little bit each year, you will experience a difference. You'll experience life. When the blood of Christ as a believer in Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, as you take that blood that's already been on your heart, by the way, on the doorpost of your heart, which is all about Passover, right? Not Easter bunny, but Passover. When we begin to take that and we incorporate it into the water of the word, which is the truth, out comes Matthew chapter 4, 24, the true worshiper. Out comes the true worshiper in spirit and in truth. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, incredible things happen on this earth. Acts chapter 2 happens, if you will. Lastly, let's turn to John chapter 7. I want to show you this in verse 37. In the last day, that great day, so this is the eighth day, the last great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So on the last day, when they're doing this water libation ceremony, and all of Israel is there, and they're shouting, they're, they're happy, they're singing, and the priest comes up and they've got the water and the singers are going crazy. They said there was one chapter that they read in front of all of the people. You know what it was? It was Isaiah chapter 12. And so Yeshua responds after they say this by saying, in the last great day, he says, anyone that believes on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Listen to what was read right before this. Isaiah chapter 12 says this, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Yahweh, is my strength and song. 
He has also become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may not see what I'm seeing right here, but when you read it in the Hebrew, like they read it during the first century water libation ceremony, you will see why what Jesus said is so huge. Because there's one single word in here in Hebrew that is translated in English as salvation. But in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. It's the name of Jesus in its original language. So let me read it again from that perspective, and you'll totally get why this is extraordinary. He says, I'll praise you. Though you were angry with me, you've turned away. You comfort me. Verse 2, behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Yahweh, is my strength and song. He has become my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of of Yeshua. What did they just do? They were drawing water from the pool of Siloam. It was the holy water at the bottom of the mountain. And he says, oh, listen, if you really knew what you were doing right now, you would understand that you are drawing water. If you never want to thirst again, you will not draw water from the pool of Siloam at the base of the mountain. No, sir, you will come with me to the top of the mountain and you will draw from my water. I am the well of Yeshua. I'm the well of salvation and my water doesn't come from the ground. No, my water comes from above. You see, this is why prophetically the water comes from above. Because God, and why the manna came from above. He's showing us that, look, the bread and the water come from God. It comes from the real well of salvation. If you'll stop looking down at your, at your situation and putting your tail between your legs and, and, oh, woe is me. If you stop looking at the ground and you start looking up to the real hope of your salvation, Yeshua, the well of your salvation, out from your belly will come rivers of life. Now, why does he use that? Because in that time period, there couldn't need be anything better than a river of life. Because the river in itself is not life. It brings life to everything around it. When a river goes through a desert, do you ever feel like you're in a desert? then you need the river of life. And where does the river of life come from? It comes from God, no questions asked. But the river flows through you. If you want to experience the joy of the water libation ceremony in your own life, you have to open up your own life. You open up your own hands. You have to humble yourself before God and praise his name like they praised like never before. They had, you, you think all these people didn't have problems. They had troubles, but they, it, it, Sukkot is over with. There's no time for troubles. There's no time for arguing. There's no time at looking at our own situation. It's about praising the King and letting the waters from heaven flow through you and give life to everything around you. I don't care how dead things are in your life. The real water libation ceremony will change your life and it will give you joy like the rabbis say that if you haven't experienced, I'll say it this way, if you haven't experienced the waters of salvation through Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and you haven't truly dedicated every single component of your life to him, then you have never experienced joy like you have the opportunity right now. And so as we come to the end of this, my friends, Recognize the prophetic significance of this holiday for you. There's two more words I want, to I want to leave you with, phrases. One is Hoshana Rabbah. It's the seventh day. It's the Sabbath. It's Jericho. It's the millennial reign of Christ. Hoshana Rabbah is, is, is praise him in the highest. It is the absolute ending of Sukkot, where it's the seventh day, Hoshana Rabbah. And it's connected to the Sabbath. How is it connected to Jericho? They went around Jericho seven times. How is it connected to the millennium? Millennium is the seventh millennium. You see, Hoshana Rabbah, that amazing seventh day is connected to all the other sevens in all of the Bible. And the perfection is built in to the very last day, which is the next day, which is Shemini Atzeret. Shemini Atzeret is the last great day. It's a high Sabbath. It's a new beginning. It's Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is, is, if you're not familiar with the Torah portions, Jews and, and believers alike will read these Torah portions, which is the first five books of Moses. 
split into small sections, three or four chapters a week. And at the end of an entire year, they've come to the very last chapter in Deuteronomy. And Simchat Torah is the beginning where they go back and start over again. How beautiful the symbolism is. For six days, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he said, look guys, I want you to rest on the seventh day. Not on the third day, fourth day, the seventh day. I want you to rest, which is Shabbat. Today is Saturday, Friday night to Saturday night and today. And then he says on the eighth day, that eighth day, what is that eighth day? That eighth day is a great day. It's a new beginning. At the end of 6,000 years, the Messiah comes. And then there's 1,000 years, one day left of rest, of Sabbath rest. And then there is a new day. That is the Shemini Etzeret. That is the eighth great day. And that's the day of the water libation ceremony where everything is made new. My friends, I encourage you in this place, in this moment, in this time to recognize there is a blessing for those that keep this feast day. There's a blessing for those that understand the symbolism. There's a blessing for understanding the words in Revelation. And let's finalize this entire teaching with Revelation chapter 19, verse nine, it says, and then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. The marriage supper of the lamb is the final Sukkot that we're all looking forward to. It is the final culmination, the coming together of God's people that doing Bible things in Bible ways that have the testimony of Yeshua and the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony built all into one. I pray that this teaching not only blesses you, but I pray that as you share it, it'll bless everybody around you. And speaking of, would you do us a favor? The greatest compliment that you could give us is to share this with someone else and hit subscribe and make sure your notifications are turned on so that you don't miss any teaching here at Passion for Truth. We appreciate you guys more than you could ever know. And without your connection to us and your prayers for us and your partnership with us financially, if this has blessed you, then consider blessing us and partnering with us so that we can reach the nations together. My name is Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries. Thank you for joining us in this long series all about the Feast Day series. We'll see you in the next video. Shalom.